Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I'm here tonight with Bruce. 14 seconds long for each wins. McCurdy. <laughs> hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? <laughs> Good. That was a nice win for the Oilers. Um, I wasn't happy I ending. Was, happy yeah. third period. Happy ending. Yeah, wasn't sure of the uh, headline of the story, but the yeah coming on of the third period uh, made it quite easy. It was a quite a battle. The Blue Jackets played really hard in the game. They outworked and um, had uh, the better chances in the first couple periods. More chances and better chances, but um, Stuart Skinner played well, and the Oilers. Cranked it up in the third period, scoring three goals. Knobloch, Coach Chris Knobloch, made some interesting uh, line changes in the third we can talk about. Yeah. Um, we can talk about him right now. Like he went to McDavid, Dreisaitl, and um, Hyman. Nuge, Kane, and Fogel. McLeod, Holloway, and um, Brown. And a line we didn't see so much of in the third, Jan Mark Gagne and Derek Ryan. So that was a mm-hmm. bit of a, he changed all the lines <clears throat> to get them. I, I think it was the right move. What do you think? Obviously. Yeah, I didn't, I <laughs> didn't hate it. I, I didn't, it didn't seem like there was much sync going on with the lines that they had. Yeah. And their big power first unit uh, was really having trouble even getting the puck, let alone get it, getting it going in the right direction. They spent it seemed like an inordinate amount of time uh, without it in their end of the ice. Maybe it was just that one endless shift that colors my perspective, but it sure didn't seem like uh, uh, they really had uh, they really had it going on. Now, that's a 10-6 in shots with McDavid on the ice, but so much of that would have been in the third period for sure. Because yeah. that's when uh, that's when Edmonton came on. What were the Grade A shots, David? Uh, in the end, it was uh, the orders had significantly more than the than the Blue Jackets because the Blue Jackets didn't have any in the third period. Bruce, uh, in total, it was sixteen to nine Grade A shots for the Oilers with the subset of five alarm shots, um, eight to six for the Oilers. But the Oilers, I think they had not. Um, what was it about? Eight, nine or ten of their grade A shots in the third period. So mm-hmm. um, it was, a, you know, Bruce, that, that line of McDavid, Hyman, and Nuge, I don't think they've been playing well for two or three games in a row or even, maybe mm-hmm. even longer. They haven't really had a great game as a unit in some time. So I don't think McDavid is close to the top of his game right at the moment. Uh, I just, you know, I just, I'm not seeing clean handles of the puck. And tonight he just sort of randomly coughed it up a couple of times on plays where you normally control it with skill, and and a little reluctant to shoot the pill. And that said, he got a goal tonight, and he had a second goal or first pretty goal nice that goal was called back. Yeah. One that was called yeah. back, and then one that was a little greasier, but uh, it counted. But yeah, I, in the first two periods, I mean, by. Um, Natural stat tricks, grade A shots, or high danger shots. They had it uh, 10-4 for Columbus through two periods and then 6-0 for Edmonton in the third at 5-on-5. Five five. And, of course, that is where Edmonton scored all three of their goals to ultimately win it 4-1. Yeah, in the first two periods, what did we have it at? 9-6 um, to six grade A shots mm-hmm. um, in the first two periods. So, Bruce... And then um, what in the third? Uh, I'd have to go and have a look here and can't add them up. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, not ten. Ten nothing. Ten nothing yeah. in the third period. Well, here's the here's the expected goals. <clears throat> and this is this is again just five on five. But after two periods, the orders had zero point seven and Columbus had 2.6 expected goals, and the score was 1-1. to Thank you, Stuart Skinner. And in the third period, the Oilers had 1.48, and Columbus had 0.01 expected <laughs> goals in the third period. I think that shortchanges. just took the game over. That shortchanges the Oilers, I think. 
I mean, there was lots of great shots. I mean, yeah, uh, one and a half. I mean, they got three, and they, you know, I think I think they were probably a little fortunate to get three out of that, but uh, they did. I mean, did they? Maybe they didn't count the deflection off Nuge off the point off the post as a great A shot on net. But uh, Fogel then got another five alarmer. Then Kane yeah. slams home a five alarmer. Mm -hmm. I mean, McDavid's uh, goal was <laughs> definitely going in because uh, Hyman. Mm -hmm. very cleverly yeah. had pushed himself in front of the goalie. I think he was trying to show Corey Perry that there's more than one guy who knows how to play around the net in this and be crafty mm -hmm. yes, uh, on well, the Oilers team. I still got the call. That was, uh, yeah. I was there. I didn't want the power play. I just wanted them to drop the puck and sort of acknowledge that the, they weren't going to challenge the goal. And when that happened, I felt the game was in a pretty good spot. And I say the Oilers, it was like they put on their capes before the start of the third period and just flew away with it. Just a complete reversal of form. This is our two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast with one conundrum, Bruce. What's your good thing? I'm going to have to go right back to Stu Skinner. Man, oh man, that guy is just on fire. He held Edmonton in this game big time. Yeah. And there, was, there was one, and just in the first period, there was one ridiculous flurry of shots uh, where they got two right in a row. The, the Oilers couldn't clear the zone mm -hmm. again, and Puck came to the guy down low, and he got a shot and the rebound that Skinner somehow batted out. And then the Oilers, Fogel took it to the corner against two guys, a really good play by Fogel to shield the puck. And then when he got control of it, then he passed it <laughs> to nobody except the other team. And they took it straight it. back to the net for a, another like <clears throat> close-in deflection. And then the four shot, it, it looked labeled, and CeCe actually got his stick on that one to put out that last oh, fire. There was yeah. a good behind-the-net replay later that proved it, and it was that was scored as such. But uh, they were uh, uh, Nurse, CeCe, like Nurse and CeCe had both sort of combined to pull the one off the line after the second save, and then it was, uh, it was just chaos. But through it all, Skinner stood... Very tall. He made a, a great save, glove grab off of a Johnny Goudreau clear cut breakaway. And uh, the one he got beat on, even that I thought, like the one that <laughs> Goudreau won, Jack Michaels thought he'd scored. And it just disappeared into uh, Skinner's glove. And then in the second period, I mean, the owners had lots of poor moments in the second period. They had one shift where they turned the puck over in their own end one time and then another time and then a third time each time it led to chaos in the crease and skinner again made some great saves there and then finally the, his team got into it in the third period he didn't actually have to do all that much but he made you know 20 28 shots 27 saves you know another night at the office for Stu skinner these days i mean it's Pretty standard, 20, 27 shots against, one or two goals against, and it's like that. Seems like almost every game. Like he, he, had a, he had a really nice save off uh -huh. Cur Sean Curley in the second two. Uh -huh. um, or kind of a quick developing play that um, he got a pad on. I think it was uh -huh. a... Um, yeah, no, he was... Yeah. He's really, really playing well. And I, I gave him an eight. Um, I gave Kulak and he him the highest marks this game. Yeah. Both of them well, his, his last seven games now, 30 shots, 26, 24, 27, 27, 27, and now 28. And he gave up two goals in two of the games and one goal in the other five games. That's just since Christmas. And every game, it's like 27 shots and one goal. It's amazing. Since... Uh, um, uh, since they turned this thing around at U.S. Thanksgiving, 20 games played, 18 wins, two losses, 933 save percentage, 1.80 goals against average over 20 game span. He is playing like, like Team Canada's once and future goalie. <laughs> not once, I guess, just their future goalie. Maybe has he been Team Canada in the World Junior Tournament? I'm not sure about that. I don't think he has. <sighs> I don't think yeah. he was the starter, at least. Bruce, uh, my good thing was the fourth goal of the Oilers. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really needed to win the game. The Oilers yeah. had the yeah. game in hand then. But, Bruce, it was – that is a that, that is a goal 
that every coach in hockey is going mm-hmm. to absolutely adore. Um, all five players touch mm-hmm. the puck. And they all, even to Hartnett, like he, he kind of wins, a, a somewhat wins at least. He advances the puck along the boards um, behind the Oilers' net. He doesn't lose the battle. He, I'm mm-hmm. not sure he outright wins it, but he, he does get pushed the puck over. Anyway, then Kulak makes a spectacular play, cutting his man out along the boards with a yeah. hard physical yeah. uh, movement of his body and slams, slams against his the body board. in between. Sure, and puts the puck up. Um, the ice to Brown, who then the the other thing coaches love is is taking a hit to make a play, and Brown on the boards does that. He's he's lined up for a hit, and then he passes the puck up. Holloway then also takes a hit to make a play. He gets kind of slammed at the blue line, but manages to get the puck ahead and down the ice. Then there's a foot race for it. Ryan McLeod and the CBJ defenseman and. And following up on all of those really great physical plays is the best physical play of the sequence. When Ryan McLeod uses both his speed, determination, and strength to win the win the physical battle, get on the right side yeah. of the um, uh, the the battle, and win the puck deep in the zone, he puts it over. So so that's all been great. And then everybody goes to the net. They do what they're supposed mm-hmm. to do. Kulak, um, McLeod spots Kulak for a great pass, and then Kulak makes an even better pass to Connor Brown, who's moved into the slot. And Connor Brown, of course, gets a great shot. This was this was a great shot, but it, there was an also a really good save. Uh, but the rebound goes to Dylan Holloway, who's also crushed the net, and he slams it in. That was one of the best uh, hard-working goals that the Oilers have scored all year long. It was, it was spectacular. Yeah, that's instructional video type stuff. You should, you could show that to uh, to any team, uh, especially their bottom six, but really to any any line on the team. And it's like they did everything right for about ten to fifteen seconds, from yeah. way down in their own end to puck in the back of the net. And what I liked was after McLeod made that good play to, to sort of gain possession of the puck, he. You know, he looked, he picked his spot, and he drilled a cross-ice feed right on Kulak's stick. Yeah. And my recollection of the play is that somehow it cycled through to Harney and back to Kulak for that outside shot. Uh, but I might have my sequencing wrong. But I thought all five guys on the team touched the puck within, like, three seconds of the goal being scored. It was pass, shot, rebound, Didn't go bang McLeod, away at it. McLeod, Kulak, and Kulak to Brown. But uh, okay. I could be incorrect. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have to... Look at the sequence. Certainly, they had uh, uh, all five players were involved in the overall sequence. And yeah, it, the Hardy it was, started it off. It was a, uh, it was a, uh, you know, just a good hard play by all of them. And Stuart, Mc, uh, Stuart, uh, uh, sorry, Ryan McLeod, that play made there, and there was a play made early in the third period. I think it was on the penalty kill, and. Uh, Columbus had the pressure on for a while, and he just overpowered some dude on Columbus about five feet inside the blue line and willed the puck over the blue line. I'm saying to my wife, you know, this Ryan McLeod, when he just used to be getting knocked for not making plays like that, well, look at him now. And he's, uh, he's very close to being my good thing again. He did a lot of things. I don't think he got any points in this game, but... Uh, he was involved in a very positive way. That line with him and Holloway looked very promising, Bruce. I mean, <laughs> that is, both those players can fly. Yeah, They're big, big guys who can fly. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> that's an inter- question, interesting question, but I really, I really did like that line. And Connor Brown can keep up with him. He's not a bad skater in it. And uh, I, I thought he had another decent game, Connor Brown. He had another Charlie Brown moment, of course. Other than that one future turnover. <laughs> oh. oh, well. He had uh, Evander Kane set him up wide open shot in the slot. And, of course, you know, he would have he would have had a wide open shot, but the puck skittered under his stick, and he, Brown missed his chance. So such is life for Connor Brown right now. Bruce, what is your bad thing? Well, my bad thing is actually me, because uh, I chose today to write nice things about Vincent DeHarnay, 
rave about his great record over the course of the 13-game winning streak with only one goal against scored on his watch and so on. And, and then in the first period, first of all, he gets burned for the breakaway. And it was an error of commission. He jumped up to a potential mm-hmm. offensive spot, and the puck turned over quickly, and Columbus made two good passes to their credit. You know, they saw the hole, and they took advantage of it. And he almost overtook Goudreau from behind. He actually was skating faster than Johnny Goudreau. I think Goudreau was way down by the puck. But uh, anyways, and then on the goal a minute later, really that wasn't... Uh, anything super bad that he did, he passed it over to Gagne and the, and the play got, Gagne flubbed it and the puck went in front and then Vince couldn't cut out the pass after because it was two against one and they executed, you know. They really did pass so, around him. It was a tough play, tough moment spot yeah. for him to be in. Kulak also kind of over, both Kulak and Naharne had moved up mm-hmm. into the play expecting McLeod to get the puck deep on that, play where they gave up the breakaway. Right, oh right, he shot from outside and it got deflected and they So they both Kulak and gone. the Harney were, were um, yeah. up there. You know, you just got to yeah. take it easy maybe if you're the third pairing defenseman and you're... When Johnny Goodrow's on the ice, you got to check over your shoulder. You want to be careful. You want to be really careful. <laughs> so maybe they weren't careful enough. Obviously, they not saying he's cherry picking or anything, but... <clears throat> Yeah, that's okay. It's okay to cherry pick if you can get away with it. It is. It is. You know, on on that play, Bruce, I had this incredible sense of empathy for Sam Gagne. I'll tell you what, like in the hockey that most of us play, you know, anyone Mm -hmm. playing minor hockey or men's hockey, (laughs) like that horrible mistake that Gagne made, like everybody makes that play once a game. And it, it it was hilarious because it was so awful. He gets the puck. He's got clear Mm -hmm. possession of it. And he just essentially whiffs on the pass and falls flat on his face. And and as this horrible scene then unfolding of Columbus whipping around the puck in front, you know, mm-hmm. whip, getting the puck, whipping around beautiful passes and getting this incredible shot on net and a, and a goal, he's sitting there on his knee. <laughs> it's, it's too late for him to do anything else, watching it. And then when they finally score, his head just drops and I just felt, yeah. I, I just really felt bad for the guy because I, yeah. I have definitely been there. Yeah. And sometimes uh, anyone not, who plays hockey knows that feeling. Sometimes it's not your night or it's not your moment. That definitely <laughs> wasn't his moment. Oh, poor guy. Uh, he, had a, yeah. he had a bit of a tough game overall, mm-hmm. but uh, mm-hmm. uh, I, I thought sort of a few of the guys that were... Um, Possible Corey Perry the guys that were, yeah, I thought a few of them were struggling tonight. Janmark. Uh, and yeah, yeah Janmark, I mean, he did make a couple good plays in his own zone, yeah. but he also had no shots, no hits, no takeaways, That's no Janmark, points, yeah. one block shot and three, almost three minutes on the penalty kill. And that's his value. Nothing happens against the Oilers when he's out there hardly at all. Yeah, I gave him and Yanmark and Brian Fours and Gagne three. They they oh. just didn't get much done. I mean, other uh-huh. than the PK. Some some okay work on the PK. But um, yeah, no, that was a you know, I guess you can take your pick now who you want to sit Corey Perry for. Well, but, during the uh, winning streak, Matthias Yanmark's played all 14 games. Mm-hmm. And the orders have outscored the combined opposition four to zero. In 140 minutes, the other guys haven't scored a single goal in seven full periods of hockey that Janmark has played. Basically 10 minutes a night for 14 nights at five on five. And, and, and as, the penalty kill. And so, Oh, and the penalty kill. Yeah, and as you know, strength, Bruce, five on five. as you know, we track the mistakes on great A shots against Janmark. Just, just, it, it, this is the second year in a row, a minuscule absolutely minuscule number of mistakes on grade a shots against Mm -hmm. he is a very safe hockey player to put on the ice and he will be playing in the playoffs (laughs) i know i know a lot of people are going to hate hearing that but Mm -hmm. watch a little closer um Mm -hmm. on the grade a shots against and see how many times you see matthias janmark make a mistake you'll be waiting uh game after game after game for that moment because it doesn't happen it probably what maybe every third game like it's so rare um, we'll play in the playoffs mistakes. for the same reason that Sammy Paulson played for Anaheim Ducks the year they won the cup. Yeah. And he played on line with Travis Moan and I'm trying to remember who's the third guy. 
And they were, I think they were called the zero line. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Nothing happened when they the were net out zero there. line. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I mean, four, four and zero against, that's actually not bad in seven periods of action. But anyway, I don't think any of those guys really distinguished themselves tonight. They, they had that one horrid shift where they couldn't get out and they had two let offs and twice they turned the puck back over. Brown made a horrendous play. He, all he had to do was skate it up the boards or dump it out in the center or anything except for what he did, which was whiff on a pass and put it right back on the stick inside the blue line. And he was the second one. I'm trying to remember who else it was before. Dry Saddle made a bad turnover to kick off an was... ugly sequence in the first. Mm -hmm. And yeah, well, Fogel, as you mentioned already, made that bad play. Right. Yeah, that was the one. And then it was, <clears throat> it was after that that Brown then couldn't get it out. And I thought, oh, bang, bang. Anyway... Okay, um, we are at our, um, oh, is it my bad thing? Yeah, it is my bad thing. All right, Bruce, um, I haven't run the numbers on the Oilers power play, uh, but it's not the power play of last season. And no. tonight, at least, Evan Bouchard looked out of sync. He's not um, getting himself in position to shoot the puck. He's he's not he's got to look for that shot, and he's not looking for it. He's looking to pass the puck, and um, so then when he gets it, he's not in position to shoot it. They need him to shoot it. They're constantly feeding it back to him to shoot it. Almost a but, for sure. but he is not set to shoot it. I I think that's a fair comment. That's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a player mm -hmm. whose skates are in the wrong direction, whose attitude isn't there. He doesn't have the shooting mentality. Or if it's there, it's a little too late because he's not he's not setting up right for it. And I don't think it's the passing, the pass backs from Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid and Ryan Nugent Hopkins. Those guys can pass. It's it's Bouchard. He's got to just make up his mind. I'm going to start any chance I get. I'm driving that puck at net for a little while here and see what happens then. You know, um, there's one other the one other option would be to to start more plays um with McDavid at the top of the umbrella top of the at the blue line with skating fast right two left. one two guys two options for one timers on mm -hmm. either side Bouchard and Drysaddle and Nugent Hopkins in the middle I guess and Hyman mm -hmm. down low Now that that now and then that might work. They you rotate know, into that point. sometimes, I think. They do. It's not, a, do, it's not a setup, but it's a... It's, Bouchard's it's one timer is not great, though. Like, I don't think right now. Like, I don't think that's his... Um, like, he'd, he'd have to work at that. But really is what he, what he has to work at is just, just get ready and launch that puck every chance he gets when there's a, when there's a decent opening. And um, that's what I think his problem is. Because he's a, he's a strong... Um, passer of the puck i don't think that's a problem that's not it it's it's he's got to shoot i just i just didn't think he was really feeling it tonight like i thought in in his own end even in the in the first period you know make a clearing pass around the boards it didn't have a chance to get out um and you know lose battles along the end wall you know he 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 does things he's a way more effective defender than many credit him with i just didn't think he was <clears throat> particularly on his game tonight showed on the power play as well at least the second unit scored hey how about that that was sweet that was nice <laughs> a great play by evander kane i mean kane had a i thought a great game and um he's the other guy i think i also gave him an eight goal and I assist mean, day him and yeah goal, goal and assist and he great goal Evander mm -hmm. Kane knows where the goals are scored, you know, between the rocks and the hard places on that ice, and he's there uh, pounding the puck in the net. So they're both, both Hyman and Kane made a little bit of a statement this game about, I'm the net front guy. No, I'm the net front guy. Mm -hmm. well, Corey Perry, you are not the net front guy. So good. It's good to have that, that competition. Good. Kane did it on the power play, and that's what helped score that, uh, yeah. that Fogel goal, eh? Was that Bouchard he was make... playing Hyman slot on the second unit, Kane, at that point. Correct. Bouchard did make a couple um, nice passes. Um, he was okay on defense. He wasn't yep. horrible, but he wasn't sharp. Uh, and, you know, he had that 
it was pointed out by the by Louis, I think. He had one chance where the puck was turned over to him right in the slot. And instead of just hammering it at the net, and anyone crazy enough to try to block the shot, he decided mm-hmm. to try a kind of a shot pass. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, I admire his offensive instincts. He's got yes. tremendous offensive instincts. And his calm mm-hmm. is part of that. So, mm-hmm. but um, I think he could set himself up a little bit better by um, hammering his hurt and shot on net. No, I, I, again, I just think he just wasn't quite dialed in tonight. And some, some nights he's got like a sixth and seventh sense going on what to do with the puck. And, and uh, you know, he, he waits all of his passes perfectly, you know. And this was just one of those nights where he was just uh, fighting it a bit. And to me, I mean, he fought through it and didn't do anything disastrous. But uh, they, you know, they were less than on top of the puck all game, that whole unit really. So that's why uh, Knobloch switched him up in the third, I would imagine. First Bruce time he's gone to Drysaddle and uh, McDavid, McDavid together, right? For an extended for, time. For a period? Yeah, maybe once before early on. In the, maybe there was a game where he had them together early on. Bruce, maybe the, like the second game. Bruce, uh, as coach, oh, yeah. what's, what's your number? Game. Yeah, my number is, what is my number? Have they updated this yet? No, I'm going to have to do it myself. Uh, yes, they've updated that. So this is uh, uh, scores by period in the streak, 14-game streak. 12 to 11 in the first period. 14 to 6 in the second period. That's pretty good. How about this? Uh, 26 to 6 in the third period. 2-0 in overtime and 1-0 in the shootout, if you want to call that a goal. But overall, 54 goals for in uh, over the uh, the course of the streak. And just is a 23 against now. And uh, they're just... Their, their goal suppression is great. And their, their, uh, their actual production, David... Uh, during this streak is 3.85 goals per game. Wow, that's good. And last year it was 3.97 or 96 for the entire season. So last year for 82 games, they didn't go 82-0, and 0, right? But they scored at a better rate than they're scoring now for the entire season. So the streak is not because they're scoring more than usual. They're actually scoring less than their established rate that of last season. But their goal suppression is off the charts. And I think this is probably where I turn it over to you. Yeah, since Christmas time, they've played 12 games. They've won them all. And they've let in 17 goals, Bruce, in 12 <laughs> games. It's like, this is like, it's like, what is this, dead puck era hockey or the 1920s or something? Like, this is um, this is crazy low. It's like they've, they've well, par- part of it is the goaltending. Like, um, but they really are suppressing grade a shots as well i mean they only gave up the nine tonight um they were all in the first two periods but um they're they're they're, they're averaging about uh 10 and a half grade a shots a game against and that's mm-hmm. down last year it was about 12 or 13 mm-hmm. so that's two grade a shots yeah. a game um that they're 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 they've cut down on that is a significant drop mm-hmm. and uh, it's reflected in the goals against so Good for the Oilers. Defensive yeah. players. It's it's not just the defensive players. It's all of them. They're all... Mm-hmm. There's still mistakes. Hockey's a game of mistakes. Yeah. But at, to a man, I think I'm seeing better defensive habits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, in... I'm talking about it in my post today. I mean, it's the goalies. It's a, it's all the defensemen. It's all the forwards doing their job. It's a penalty kill unit. It's Mark Stewart's work yeah. on the penalty kill. It's Paul Coffey's work with the defensemen. It's... Chris Knobloch's work with the team, like uh, they all seem to be pulling on the same oar, and even on nights where it's not like going smoothly, which is a lot of nights in the early first half of games, there's been a lot of or taking Oilers a while to find their game, but when they find it, they just took this one over in the third period. You know, 19 shot attempts to three in the third period. And I think it was seven to eighteen the other way in the second. I mean, just so, uh, just uh, two periods of Mister Hyde and one of Doctor Jekyll. 
Bruce, um, for tonight's conundrum, I'm going to go to something. I'm going to switch it up to what we talked about earlier. I wrote a post earlier today about Anson Carter's take mm -hmm. on, he was asked by David Amber um, it, before the Vancouver game the, last night, um, which team from Canada is most likely to win, win the Stanley Cup? And all the other panelists, including David Amber, Luke, uh, so Luke Gazdick, um, what's the other guy? Um, Justin Williams and Amber mm -hmm. all picked Vancouver. Yep. But Anson Carter um, said this. Here's what he said, quote, as much as I want to jump on the Vancouver bang bandwagon, I'm saying Edmonton. In order to win championships, you need to have elite level players. Vegas never took that next step until they had Jack Eichel. Edmonton has two guys. Plus, it's a lot deeper than just the two horses they have up front. Stuart Skinner is playing well. Their backup is playing well, too. So I'm going with the Edmonton Oilers, unquote. And Bruce, he set off an absolutely monumental Mount Everest sized snit fest in Vancouver with that comment. On social media, people are all over Anson Carter. Canuck fans are. And I think you can probably guess what the comment was that, that set them off. Can you? Uh, I sort of let it all wash over me. I wasn't okay. isolated it, on anyone. In thing, order but... to win championships, you need to have elite level players. Ooh. So everyone in Vancouver immediately was like, WTF? Mm -hmm. um, Thatcher Demko? Quinn Hughes, yeah. Elias Peterson, mm -hmm. um, JT Miller. He's pretty good. He's pretty good. So anyway, I think it's actually. The first three you mentioned, I, I would call elite players. And then JT Miller and Besser. And, they, you know, they got they got a good team in Vancouver. They got a lot of they good players. They have some elite players. Like Thatcher Demko could win the series all along. I guess my, and uh, you know what? Um, I was thinking about this, like this huge hostile reaction in Vancouver. And it reminded me when the Oilers uh, first turned it around in 2017 and there was all these pro prognostications that the Oilers were going to go far in the playoffs, even win the Stanley Cup, mm -hmm. uh, heading into the 2017-18 season. And then they started to go downhill. And we Oilers fans were so, at that point, so insecure about the team and so thirsty for success for that team that any little comment would really get on yep. everybody's nerves. Um, anyone doubting it or anything like that was was really bothersome. And I think Vancouver's in the same place. They've missed the playoffs seven out of the last eight years. So they just, they, they are desperate for their team to be good. And their team mm -hmm. is good. But they don't want to hear anyone in any way mm -hmm. say anything negative about that that team. In the end, though, as you and I know, it doesn't matter what anyone says. All that matters is what's going to happen in the playoffs. And and all of these teams, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Vancouver, um, in the West, Colorado, uh, Dallas, mm -hmm. Los Angeles, Las Vegas, there are so many good teams and so many teams oh, that could sure. beat other teams. And that's all that matters is, in the end, who's going to come out triumphant on whatever, like any little fun like this doesn't, it doesn't amount to anything. Well, I mean, they ask the analysts to give their opinions. Yes. And it, we had the same discussion about P.K. Subban the other day, where he gave a dated opinion on what the Oilers used to be like. And I vehemently disagree with uh, P.K. Subban's uh, opinion, which is different from saying that I hate P.K. Subban, or I think he's, you know, uh, again, I mentioned the personal comments there, and... and uh, uh, for Sue Ban, who's a guy, you know, went to the Stanley Cup finals and got to the third round a couple times, which is more than the Oilers have done. They've made the third round once. Uh, so, and he also donated $10 million to a children's hospital. So there's that. Uh, anyways, uh, this is, uh, uh, the fact is one guy goes against the opinion and people have a conniption about it. Remember yeah. last year when that one dude voted McDavid fifth for the Hart Trophy and everybody else had him first, so he got he didn't get his unanimous selection. And so what's your takeaway? He didn't get a unanimous selection? Or is that one guy's uh, opinion is pretty wonky, and he's probably based on some theories that uh, 
that uh, haven't been tested. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so uh, it's all part of the fun, I guess. Why, yeah, why lose your shit mm, over it? Yeah, somebody's opinion, and especially I'm hope they're not insulting him, but uh, you never know. And of course, in, in the NHL, they have, uh, yeah. You know, Anson Carter's an interesting player because he was, he, you know, he had three really good seasons in Edmonton and one heck of a season in Vancouver as well. So he's known and, oh. and probably liked in both cities by Oh, sure. By fans nice guy. Everybody liked him. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I, I was surprised by, because when I first heard the comment, I was actually wondering, like, I kind of got it, like, why they're upset, but it, it just seems so outsized the reaction. Oh, cho- choice of words. I mean, those guys, I, I think they do have... So three. Peterson is an elite. elite player. Quinn players. Hughes yeah, and Depko. Those yeah. are they are like Peterson isn't arguably the best player, but mm-hmm. at his position. But Demko and Hughes are in that conversation right now. Well, here's Demko's their positions. La- here's Demko's last twenty games. I gave you the numbers for Skinner a little bit ago. Eighteen two, one eighty nine thirty three. Demko's pretty good. Sixteen three and one nine twenty one and two fifty. So a, good, but not quite as, you know, Skinner's actually, if you go strictly by numbers, Skinner's outplayed Demko in the last well, two months. He's no Stu Skinner, I mean, but not well, everybody is. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe the Oilers have another elite player that we just haven't quite blended into the mix yet. But uh, I'm starting to get convinced after watching one game after another. of. I, I, I love what Stu Skinner's doing. I don't know. I, I just need to see it in the playoffs. Honestly, yeah. well, and I'll come back. This came up on the internet more than once. Well, he was shitty in the playoffs last year, therefore, he's always going to be. Bad I was in overworked. The playoffs. He was overworked. Anyway, uh, my comeback was in his first year in the playoffs, mind you, at a much younger age. Grant Fuhrer, Hall of Fame goalie Grant Fuhrer, won five Stanley Cups here, had a 505 goals against average and 853 save percentage against LA Kings in 81 oh, 82. My goodness. The miracle of Manchester. Yeah, that one. Yeah. And then the next year he watched from the bench while Moog played. And by 83 84, Fuhrer was starting and winning and they won the Stanley Cup. So, I mean, what a guy does as a rookie shouldn't tar and feather him for the rest of his life. It's one thing that happened and now he's still got his career to play. And Grant Fuhrer sure turned it around. Well, Stu was trained by the great. Mike Smith, and and I don't say that in any way, but like face value, he make great. Mike Smith was a was fantastic, charismatic, goalie. iconoclastic. Mike, yeah, Smith. yeah. <laughs> Wasn't he in The Walking Dead? Didn't he kill like eight thousand zombies with his pen? Anyway, he Stuart it's Skinner. Stare. Yeah, just he's just <laughs> that was it. His hockey stick. <laughs> That's it. His goalie stick. And his skates. He'd huck a skate at them. Um, so Stuart Skinner, uh, he's just so calm. And and we yeah. I have made this comparison before, and it and it's a it's a little bit outrageous, but you know, there maybe maybe someone else made it. But the Ken Dryden comparison comes to that mind. Just me, great actually, big. That was you. Okay, there you go. <laughs> you made it before. Just this hulk, great big hulking goalie, and again, there's a lot more of them these days, but um, who is calm in the nets and saves all the ones that should be saved and um, isn't is besides, on tonight. a team getting out, that's out chanting the other team consistently, but when he may, needs to make the save, he's there. And that's been Stu Skinner for, for the last two months, and um, it's fantastic to see. So I'm hoping he can keep it up. Well, after that four-shot barrage in like eight seconds or six seconds or whatever that was, yeah, um, that was, and the crowd was all—I thought they were all going stew, stew. And I, my son says they deserve to be booed, and I said, "Oh yeah, I think they're saying stew. Come on, now we're supporting our team here, right?" <laughs> uh, it was, uh, but it, it does. I, bet remind, you it was I used stew. to see games like that, Montreal Canadiens. And they'd come out, and they, you know, they wouldn't always dominate from the drop of the puck. And sometimes they would, and if it was a home game on Saturday night, you'd see maybe two of these a year because it didn't happen all that often. If they were trailing in the third period at home, they would actually get booed by their home fans. If they were trailing a game that they should win and, you know, the power play wasn't working or something and the cat calls would start, and they'd pick it up and they'd win. But what would have happened in the meantime is that Ken Dryden would have made two or three stellar saves to keep it at 2-1 instead of 4-1. And at the end of the night, he'd have 20 shots and two goals against, and he'd be nowhere near the board of the three stars, but he would have delivered 
in the crunch, and that's what Skinner's been doing, keeping Oilers in games. And what the team's been doing, of course, is taking over those games and in the third period and beyond, as as per my numbers tonight. Alrighty. Well, Bruce, um, maybe we should leave it there. So um, thanks for thanks for talking tonight. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.